episode 81 of Dog Behavior Q&A, uh, where you get to ask as many questions as you like, and I try to, to answer them to the best of my ability. We are live on Facebook and YouTube, so we have 80 other videos answering common questions that the audience may have. All right? So, make sure. You ask as many questions as you like, and like I said, we'll give our best effort to answer them. Okay? All right, and today we will be talking about one thing that I, that's sort of a common denominator among uh, some clients, I would say most clients, as to why their dog acts out in the first place. All right? So this is just information that I gather from the hundreds of people that I talk to and trying to really figure out, nail down why their dog acts the way they do. But first, let's answer some questions that we have already. All right. So uh, I have watched a lot of your videos and have learned a lot. Cheers, Patrick. Um, and she has improved a lot from what I've learned and asking you on here as well, but she still needs some work before that I would really, really like to, that I would really like to get an early jump on. Is there anything you would recommend, such as whining at the window, peeing in the house when at work? Um, so yeah, real quick, if the dog is peeing while you're at work, that dog, that means the dog needs to be in a crate while you're at work. And then if you're concerned that you, the dog is in the crate for too long, then you should hire someone to just let them out or ask your neighbor if you can let your dog out, give her some exercise as well. But um, the dog shouldn't have free roam in the house if the dog thinks it's okay to pee in the house. And make sure that you can also uh, evaluate how much water they're getting, when they're getting their water. Okay, um, you have to kind of learn your dog in that regard. Some dogs can hold it for a long time, but some can't. And so you're gonna, you kind of have to uh, learn their their bladder uh, threshold or capacity. And so you can manipulate how much water their intake they're getting, um, and you may have more success when it comes to peeing in the house. But if it's a puppy especially if it's under a year old, it may need to, get, to be in the crate to stay in the crate. Um, and you may have to go back to basics as far as potty training the dog. All right, thank you for your question. Feel free to ask another one. All right, I got another question on Instagram. Uh, oh, got a question live. That's, that's the other thing, guys. You who are watching live, so, the questions that I'm answering right now are questions that I've gotten emailed throughout the week or uh, before we went live. Cheers, E. How's it going, brother? Um, and so live questions have the priority. All right. If you guys ask questions live, I will answer them. I'll stop what I'm talking about and I'll answer your question. So that's what I'm about to do. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me bring it up. All right, GSD barks and lunges at dogs every time he sees one. He vocalizes when we correct intent. Uh, any other ideas, bonk? Um, okay, so, so when I have a dog who decides to be that intense, I'm guessing the dog is intense, more intense than the average dog, okay. Um, so one of the things that I really focus on when I have a dog who either gets more intense when when you give the correction or uh, decides to redirect, bite, things, that and the other, based on the tool. Okay, so two things have to happen, in my opinion. First and foremost, you have to be able to talk the dog through it. Be more vocal with the correction. All right, so... 
Use your words. Your words have to be more dominant or prominent uh, than the the e collar, the prong collar, the pet condenser, the dog and dog, any tool that you're using. Your voice has to take precedence over all those tools. Okay. That's the first thing. Um, because I've worked with a lot of dogs who come to me that are <clears throat> tool savvy, collar savvy. Or just in a negative way, reactive towards the tool. And the way to combat that is to use your voice along with the tool, and then start weaning the dog, uh, weaning the dog off the severity of the correction. And your voice starts to mean more and take precedence than the all of the tool correction, because your voice needs to be the 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 thing that's going to be there because when the tools come off you still have what your voice so i would say a lot of voice coaching through those situations along with the tool and then use your voice as the primary way of guiding them and then use the tool as the backup but sometimes i think trainers use the tool as the priority and not enough voice for whatever reason but i've had success getting the dog through redirecting really stressful situations knowing that the correction is going to come by talking through talking them through the situation okay so that's the the first one the second one is getting the dog to make make making sure the dog is um, very obedient with said tools without the the without the stimuli all right so more practice on getting the dog to really respond to uh, the the your tools that you're working with separate from the stimuli or just use a different sort of stressor or stimuli for example if that GS, if that German Shepherd is acting that way towards dog, then you want to practice the same commands, voice and tools, with a door threshold, right? Like, like putting the dog in place, opening the door, knocking on the door, and still, still using those same tools that you'll use when you're walking your dog. So on the backhand side of things, if you can really proof those things, you'll get a dog that will more likely listen. You know, and so here's the other thing. All right, make sure that when you're dealing with a dog like this, um, the best option for that dog is to have a board and train with the dog. Because here's the deal. When you're dealing with aggression, Many people tell me and ask me, if my dog doesn't act like this away from home, how the hell are you going to address the issues? And what makes it cool is that you don't really necessarily have to address said issue. That's it, necessarily, okay? Because some dogs really thrive on just getting them to a really good state of mind when it comes to just the basic skills sitting for duration in a very compliant way downing with duration in a very compliant way coming in and out of the crate with duration in a very compliant way and I want you to not underestimate the power of duration you know, because that can mean different things to different trainers. Duration. How much time you are spending doing what I just said. How much time are you, are you sitting the dog before you take a walk? How much time are you sitting there with the dog before you let him out of the crate? Are their minds allowed to totally go through the process? Or are you cutting it short? Are you letting the dog out of the crate just because it's sitting? Because you shouldn't. Are you walking the dog just because you the dog sat when you asked him to sit? Because you should. Are you 
going on to the next exercise just because the dog downed for you right away because you're sitting so you really want to experience a dog who, um, who is engaging with you on a very deeper level on those very basic skills before you want to take them through those the stress the stressful situations to have her to ever have a lot of chance in reaching the dog with just your voice because that's the goal the goal is to reach the dog with just your voice no tools eventually e-collars are not like lifetime things and prong collars aren't lifetime things they should be something that should be temporary and uh, tools to get the dog to respond to the respect of the the owner's voice. So, um, tough situation, but board and trains really work with that. I hope you're working that dog in a board and train and not a private lesson. Because um, it's much harder and difficult to deal with aggression and behavior modification when you're only working with private lessons. All right, if I'm, uh, feel free to ask another question about that. Okay. Next question. All right, not exactly general dog training info, but luckily, got one of the working spots for your upcoming visits to SoCal with Hope to Canine. Any pre-work tips ahead of your visit so my dog and I can get the most out of the day? I've got a somewhat drivey kitty and already do some work with bite work and tug. We have never done bite work on a person so far. I've considered trying Schutzen for on, ongoing enrichment, but it is all a bit overwhelming and I have no idea what to start working on. Thanks in advance and looking forward to meeting with you in a few weeks. Um, I would have to clearly know what your bite work, what, what you're doing with your bite work to tell you how to take the next step or what to take the next step with. All right, here's the deal. Here's something that you can do. and But again, it just really depends on where you're at as far as bite work goes. Um, come on, man. I had a few beers at your house, man. I can't be, I can't be, uh, I gotta be somewhat being able to think about these questions here. <laughs> um, so there's, it's water for me tonight. But, uh, but anyway, I, I think, um, you know, it depends. It just depends on where you're at as far as um, the level at which your dog is, you, you know, showing the amount of prey drive and how your dog deals with the adversity of biting a stranger or biting the biting from a stranger holding a pillow or something that the dog should bite. Um, it depends on the level of how your dog can handle it because say your dog is very comfortable with just biting, you know, it'll bite any pillow, anything that's, you know, sort of presented as a, as a toy. It depends on how comfortable your dog is. Then we can start really getting the dog to, um, anticipate, uh, the scenario and we can start getting what they call a holding bark out of the dog so the dog start barking for the pillow right and then you can start pattering um pattering is that pattern ing is that a word you can start to pattern the bark uh rhythmically and getting the dog to understand that if the dog barks in this rhythm uh then it gets a bite so that would be sort of a good next step as far as how uh, if your dog is very drivey, prey drive and will do anything, then we can get the dog anticipating and frustrated enough to go roof, roof, roof because it should be nice and patterned. So again, it just depends on um, where your dog is. Can't really give you that advice unless I see a video or unless I see the dog um, or and I see you guys playing, but um, you know, again, a lot of people that we're going to be working with when that seminar comes around, 
in San Diego is uh, teaching people how to build that prey drive even more. Okay, I think that's a very basic uh, skill that you do with puppies, but how do you build it, build it, build it, build it, build it, and then you start adding obedience to it and you start adding little things to help the dog think, how do I get this? And, and um, that also has to do with obedience, but um, so we'll see, we'll see. I can't really, again, like I can't, if you can send me a video, I can tell you better, um, but we'll be teaching definitely how to build flight prey drive, how to bite properly, and how to um, get calm grips. Okay, your dog should be biting and being able to hold the grip calmly without any nerves or growling or, or growliness or biting because um, a lot of dogs have trouble being touched while they have the, 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 pillow, the pillow or whatever it is in their possession and you want to work through that as well. Calm grips. All right, that's, that's something that's uh, very stressed uh, by good trainers in shits and sport dogs work. Um, and even police canines, they should learn how to bite calmly and not uh, in an insecure, crazy, unstable, nervous way. All right. Thank you for your question. Okay. We got some questions live. Hold on, folks. Here I come. Okay. Those of you who are watching on YouTube, feel free to ask questions. As many as you would like. Okay. And uh, let's get this party started. All right. Board and train will work only to an extent. You need to work one on one with the owner. I agree. I think. Um, yes, working one on one with the owner is definitely important. But I will re-emphasize that when you work with an aggressive dog, one-on-one -on -one is not going to work to the extent that a board and train can work. Um, I would say this. If you don't train the owners, board and train, private lessons, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. you got to train the owners either way. But when you're working with aggression, um, it's... It's, it optimizes learning for the dog and it's safer for the trainer and society and other dogs because the dog is less likely to act out. All right. I would say more energy than voice over tool even. What does that mean? You have to you have to uh, explain what you mean by more energy than tool because I, I don't know what you're talking about. All right. My year and a half old boxer is shy around men. She isn't aggressive. When they approach her, she hides behind me or tries to get away. If they ignore her, she is curious and eventually approaches. I don't know why, because in our house, it myself, my husband, and 17-year-old son, who she adores, how do I get her over her shyness? So, Natalie, what you're going to have to do, because the dog is young, um, what you're going to have to do is start learning how to get your dog to trust you more than it feels the need to advocate for itself right now. When stress is present, presented, the dog decides to do what the dog feels is necessary for her uh, in order to alleviate that stress, which is hiding behind you or tries to get away. But you want to have the relationship with your dog. Uh, you want to have the relationship with your dog where if you tell her it's okay, then it should actually be okay. Hey, Pat, how are you? Um, and you want to be able to get your dog to really trust your leadership and your word. And in order for that to happen on a, on a, um, 
you know, a lower level is to get your dog to start doing things despite what the dog wants to do. For example, a small thing is to get your dog to walk right beside you on a walk, loose leash, um, with people walking around, dogs walking around, all those things. Very basic. Or, um, your dog can... You should have the ability to tell your dog to go lay down. Or, yeah, just go lay down, despite uh, you guys sitting down, eating, watching television. Um, so, when you get your dog to understand that it has to do certain things, despite how it feels or what it wants, then, you're, then your dog starts to understand that you are going to enforce certain things no matter what. And then when you start to bring things over or present the dog with things that stress them out, like people, they will more than likely take your word for it because they, they would have had to on, in different uh, aspects or different scenarios. So um, we teach people uh, that dogs who are uh, charge the door and or bark a lot at the door or bite guests. We teach dogs on a very lo uh, basic level that if you go lay down without any of that stuff going on, when I tell you to, you're more likely to go lay down when people come over. So when no one's around and it's just you and the dog or you and your family and the dog and the dog is completely safe, Get the dog to, to listen to you uh, with much certainty so that so then what happens is the dog starts to listen to you more so than listening to itself because it's still a child at that point, very young, so it needs that sort of guidance. The dog starts to listen to you more than listening to itself and the dog starts to open its mind about change. Um, in perspective of what uh, and who um, what things are about so you want to get that drive that message in that if I say go lay down I'm actually also telling you and letting you know that everything's okay so if you listen to me everything's gonna be okay but you can't just have a dog who is allowed to do what it wants fearful or super happy because uh, super happy is obnoxious and fearful is dangerous. So either way, the dog should be listening to you. And then uh, really good things happen after that. So everything happens through your leadership, through your advocacy, and through the trust that you built on a lower level. Okay. Thank you for your question. Feel free to ask another one. Yep, finding that out with rescue, we are fostering. You are getting your nails dremeled, whether you like it or not. Yeah, I just did that to my foster. I'm fostering a Great Dane right now, and I just did his nails yesterday. And um, he didn't he he didn't like it, um, which was you know which is better than I expected. But he didn't do anything you know negative like try and bite me, which is awesome. So I really, really like that. Um, I'm actually taking him to uh, a school, a local school tomorrow or next week. And we're going to talk about the benefits of a therapy dog. So I've got some work to do with him. I've been taking him out uh, to public places and, and really trying to get him uh, used to what the public can bring as far as sounds, you know, any everything, anything and everything that uh, the outside world can show. So, I appreciate your question. Um, like I said, feel free to ask another one. Okay. So, let's talk about the, the topic a little bit here. I've realized this in talking to some people, uh, recently. Um, I really like having conversations with people with about dogs, um, no matter, you know, if you're a new dog owner, a seasoned dog owner, 
uh, a dog trainer, uh, a dog, just a dog enthusiast. There's something you can get out of every conversation that you have. And what I like to do with my potential clients or whatever it is, is be open to those conversations. And I hope that a lot of, if there's any dog trainers that are watching that want to continue to learn, you can also learn from clients. You can also learn from dog owners. Um, but you got to be open to hearing what they have to say. And treat people like they are individuals and not try and put them in a box. And not try and blame them. And not try and say, oh, they're just like this, this, that, and the other. The, the typical da, 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 da. Because no situation is uh, the same. No one's typical. And so... I really leave time, although it is time consuming. I do leave time to talk to people because I do find that it helps me as well. And I think the 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 the, the you know the potential clients or the people who I'm talking to they really enjoy someone who takes the time to evaluate their situation in specific and try and help them as best that uh, we can. So, that being said, here's the deal. A lot of dog owners come to me and obviously there's a lot of stuff that they can clean up. Dog on the couch. Dog being petted whenever it wants to be pet. Dog being let out whenever it wants to be let out. Dog on counter. Uh, dog chewing up stuff, even dog biting, um, stuff like that. And I go, hmm, well, why is this happening? What the, here's, here's a common denominator. Uh, there's two. One is lack of time. Okay, maybe your life is busy. You don't really have time to dedicate to your dog. And as a result of the lack of time, we fall into a guilty uh, downward spir spiral to where we are not who we need to be um, in order to keep the dog humble. We allow certain things to go on because we feel guilty that maybe we've left the dog in the house for so long, we've left the dog in the crate for so long, um, or we feel uh, that the dog isn't happy. So if you're in a relationship with your dog and you feel guilty about certain things, then the dog will act out because you will not, you will feel bad about being the authoritative figure necessary to alleviate that guilt. So, having the discipline to give the dog what it needs on a day-to-day -day basis will help diminish that guilt and put you in a position where you can be the authoritative figure you need to be for your dog. I'm guilty of it. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that right now. I am guilty of what I'm talking about. Okay. And again, it's all about making sure you're giving your dog a good life and what you would perceive as a good life because there's different definitions of what a good life is. But you got to reach a point with the relationship with your dog that you are giving your dog a good life. That's the only way you're not going to feel bad about being uh, the leader that you have to be in order for the dog to learn um, and keep everyone safe and be happy and stress-free living with your dog. I am very tough on my dogs, but I feel as though I give my dogs a really good life. That's the only way that I can be tough. If I'm tough and not giving them a good life, and that just makes me a butthole. 
And so I do know that there are people who fall vi victim to that. They don't give their dog what they would perceive as a good life. And so they allow the dog to what they would call being happy as being on the couch, running amok around the house, and um, not really being the authoritative figure that they need to be when they need to be it because they're caught, trapped in their guilt. So what we have to focus on is having the discipline enough to spend time with our dog so that we can alleviate or pay someone else to spend time with your dog. Um, so we can alleviate that guilt and say, all right, get off the couch or go away. You've had enough. You've had your fun. You're good. You have a good life. Get away from me. Those type of things. All right, I'll stop a minute and uh, answer this question. Okay. Our German Shepherd, Jake, will be two next week, and he seems to have gone backwards lately as far as fence charging and barking. Nothing has changed as far as his training. No going on furniture and bed, grading him and using place. We use a shock collar outside, but if it's not on, or when he's in the house, he's been going crazy. If it's not on, or when he's in the house, he's been going crazy. Charged the window when he heard kids going by and destroyed the blinds. He never did anything like that before. Advice, please, before I lose my temper. Uh, all right, so this, what I've been talking about, will should directly apply to you. Are you giving Jake what he needs? Do you have the time to actually give Jake what he needs? Because exercise is the actual, exercise actually means the release of anxiety. Are you giving your dog what he needs on an exercise level first? Because it's very tough for a dog that has built up anxiety to not act out. Energy is going to be released one way or the other. And again, some dogs can be obedient despite having that anxiety or the lack of the release of energy. But is that actually fair to the dog? I do know things get easier if they don't have that anxiety within them anyway. But if my dog is up and around and charging the blinds and chewing them, uh, then I have to I have to uh, evaluate how much free roam of the house in the house I'm actually giving the dog. You know that dog should be on its bed when it's in the house and not free roaming, but. Going back to what I'm talking about, if we're feeling guilty of the lack of exercise we give our dog, then who in their right mind is going to just keep them on a bed the entire time? That's kind of unfair. But, like I said, if we are giving our dogs the proper uh, things that they need, uh, then you may not feel as inclined or may not feel as guilty telling the dog to go lay down or the dog may just do it because it's already fulfilled so um but i would definitely uh evaluate how much free time i would allow jake to have in the house evaluate how much uh you know actual uh, mental and physical exercise you're giving the dog. Make sure you have time for the dog um, and giving it what it needs and then seeing what you get.
Okay. Thank you for your question. All right. Let's see what else. All right. So true. You've made my. You made very excellent statements. Appreciate it, Lacey. Thank you. Um, but yeah, back to what I was saying. Uh, again, I fall victim to it myself. Um, there's got to be a there's got to be limits and boundaries to even that. You know, like what is a good life for your dog? I would say this. This is what I want to provide every dog owner that works with me. I want to be able to give them off leash ability. Uh, I want them to be, I want the dog owners to be able to walk with their dog off leash. Okay, I do think and I do know that dogs are the most fulfilled uh, when they are able to sort of quote unquote migrate with their owner. Sniff, run, pee, you know, play get excited. Uh, I think that's one of the best things you can provide your dog. Um, and so I used to live next to a guy who had this dog who had many problems, but he would be out there all the time with her, with the dog Zoe. And you know, that dog now is just so impressive. The dog doesn't bark at anything, any dog that walks by. He just sits in the yard and just watches. And I really, really have to point that to how that every day, even during lunch, twice a day, they take the dog out, get that dog fulfilled exercise-wise, and he, he called the train the dog by himself. And, you know, the dog just seems stress-free, man. It's pretty freaking cool to see the dog uh, be so relaxed in what a lot of dogs can't handle you know um and so again we have to do what we have to do as dog owners to make sure that our dogs are fulfilled or do what it takes in order for us to feel okay being the authoritative figure or being tough on our dog um is okay because if we're not that's when little things can start to be uh, start to slip or um, start to we start to let go because we're caught up in that guilt so whether you have to hire a dog walker whether you have to take your dog to dog daycare or whether you have to adjust your schedule no more TV or not uh, um, less TV time or something like that whatever it is Think about what to do to help your dog alleviate some of the anxiety that it has. If you're just coming home from work and you're sitting on the couch and you let the dog out of the crate that's been there all day or even just been in the house all day and you don't spend 15 minutes walking the dog or playing ball with the dog, well then of course the dog's going to act out. And it's nobody's fault but yours. You got a dog, you got to spend time with it. Somebody has to spend some time with the dog. All right. So anybody watching on Facebook or YouTube, you guys have any final questions, feel free to uh, go ahead and type them in. Otherwise, we are going to go. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be back next week. Um, like I said, I do have a seminar going on in Southern California on June 3rd. Um, and we're going to be doing bite work. It's a bite work seminar. A lot of pet owners want to learn how to properly teach their dog bite work. Because a lot of pet dogs have uh, prey drive. And they may not necessarily want to join a Schutzen Club. Because Schutzen Clubs can kind of be uh, exclusionary or... Just kind of, you know, clicky or, you know. So, teaching your dog how to uh, bite properly and stuff like that is another good way to alleviate anxiety and energy. 
So, um, yeah, home to K9. Uh, it, it's hope to K9 Rescue is hosting it. And uh, all the proceeds are going to that rescue. So, all right, guys. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. We'll see you next week at 6 o'clock. Come with some questions. And I'll try to come with some answers. See you next week. Bye-bye.